Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third lecture on cavity optomechanics. Uh, just um, as yesterday, if you have questions, please post them in the chat or unmute yourself uh, during the lecture. Um, we also had someone transcribe the uh, requested live transcript feature. If you do need the live transcript for accessibility reasons, do request it again. We just didn't enable it yesterday because we weren't sure how accurate it works. But if you really need it, please request it again and then we'll leave it on. With that, um, I hand over to Vittorio and we look forward to your lecture. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we start um, with some slides and then I will switch to the board uh, later on. Okay, where did I want to start? Uh, Ah, yeah, exactly, yes. So, ah, wait, I should share the screen, first of all. Um, okay. Okay, so last time we, um, yeah, we discussed input-output uh, uh, theory and, um, but I never wrote the full uh, automechanical Newtonians, uh, full automechanical Langevin equations, uh, including the interaction. So they're given here. Um, and uh, so it's like every, both the mechanical oscillator and the optical, they are described mathematically as a cavity. Uh, so the main difference is that now the, um, the mechanical oscillator we, we Decoupled to a hot buff. You don't see it yet from, from the equation, but this uh, fluctuation that are entering the mechanical oscillator uh, will uh, uh, include also some thermal noise. Um, and uh, then there is this optomechanical coupling, um, uh, which is um, uh, basically driving the, the for, for the for the mechanics, it's, uh, it's the radiation pressure force. So basically this is the force, the radiation pressure. Uh, whereas from the point of view of the optics, basically just shift uh, the, the cavity resonance if I have uh, a displacement of the mechanical oscillator. Uh, okay, these are my equation. And um, I already write them in, instead of term of, in terms of the position, in terms of the ladder operators. And you see that I can group uh, the optomechanical coupling uh, with the um, uh, basically the sides of the of the zero point fluctuation of, of the mechanical oscillator in a in a single uh, coupling constant that now has the dimension of a frequency uh, and this is what is called single uh, photon optomechanical coupling. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, there are. Uh, uh, Vittorio, quick yeah. question. Sorry. Um, the, the, should there be the, the should the operators be under the square root or? Um, where? Ah, you put the b in and a in under the square root. I suppose there. Ah, yeah, that's a typo. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be under the square root. Yeah, only the only the. Uh, yeah, thank you for pointing this out. Yes, uh, they shouldn't be. Okay, uh, and. Uh, uh, probably they're going to be all the time because then I copy them, paste them. So uh, uh, Kai is right, so to point this out. Uh, okay, and then uh, this uh, full optomechanical equation uh, that describe uh, situation for any arbitrary G0, gamma, kappa, for any arbitrary parameter uh, is difficult to render because it's non linear. So we assume that when we have a linear cavity, we can very easily just solve the equation of motion for the operator and then calculate any noise correlator. Uh, and so that if we have a full solution in this case, it's not possible. Uh, so this is the first issue with this. And then the second issue is that in any case, this G0 is typically really very small. And so if I would have very in, in basically all um, optomechanical system that has been realized to date, maybe with some exception if I have cold atoms. Uh, so if I have just one photon in the cavity uh, uh, and few or just a few photons in, in, in the cavity and uh, uh, 
the mechanical uh, motion is not highly excited. Uh, basically, the, the optomechanical interaction is completely uh, negligible, so you could produce an effect. And so that's why typically what we have is what, that we are driving very hard the cavity with the laser and that we have a large number of circulating photons. Uh, and so this is the situation that we are most interested in that we give rise to all the interesting physics. And so the idea is, uh, okay, this situation, I don't need to solve the full uh, uh, Langevin equation is in its whole glory. I can use an infield approach. And uh, in this case, the, uh, the, this mean field approach consists in two steps. So in, in the first step, I calculate what are the mean field, and then I uh, deal uh, rather with the linearized Langevin equation. So I, I will go through these two uh, steps. Uh, so the first step is uh, basically I take the average in this equation, and then I just want to, I want to find the stationary solution, a static stationary solution where the, the field amplitude and the, and the mechanical displacement are, are fixed. Uh, and basically, I just uh, take the average and set the derivative to zero, and I arrive to this equation. Uh, you see here, I, uh, I'm not taking into account this decay rate, uh, gamma, so here it does not appear in this equation. This has to do with this uh, discussion that we had last time that uh, in any case, this equation is valid only for a very high quality factor oscillator. So this omega should be much larger than, than gamma. And so it doesn't make sense to, to take into account this term here. Yeah. So it's uh, because I've done an, an approximation I've, and I would get some correction that it's in any way wrong. Okay, so this is, I write to this equation and I can solve uh, uh, for alpha square as a function of beta and replace it in the other equation. Um, and then I write to this equation, and this is, uh, I had already mentioned this, uh, this equation from alpha, it's the same equation that I would uh, uh, find if I consider a weakly nonlinear oscillator, uh, ducting oscillator, uh, so with a kernel linearity, and um, I do a rotating wave approximation if the nonlinearity is, uh, and then I arrive in a minute Okay, I arrive at this kernel Hamiltonian, and then basically, I would, if I want to find the stationary amplitude, and I drive this oscillator linearly, and I want to drive the stationary amplitude, I would get exactly the same equation with this uh, uh, two uh, G0 square, a square uh, play, two G0 square divided by omega plane the row of the, of the nonlinearity, of the kind of linearity. And then I find this kind of uh, course, so Laurentian, if, uh, uh, the the amplitude uh, uh, if the driving is, is small uh, um, and uh, then I start to have this bending and this by stability you see it's a third order equation so it means uh, it can have um, up to three uh, real roots uh, and um, uh, but it turns out that one of them is uh, describe an unstable solution. So I have just two solutions. This is what we discussed also last time. Okay, now I have this, I've calculated my mean field and the, uh, the next thing that I do, I, I do an approximation. Uh, so uh, I had this full nonlinear Hamiltonian and uh, basically what I do, I define these uh, fluctuations about the stationary mean field. Uh, and uh, I replace uh, this, uh, this term in, in my expression of the Hamiltonian. And the approximation that I'm doing, I, I will neglect all the terms that uh, um, contain uh, basically all the fluctuations. So three, the qubit term with three fluctuations. Uh, so I will do the same thing also for B. Uh, there will be beta plus delta b, and I like that other term that uh, that contain three three fluctuations, because they this because this term will be proportional to g zero, and so they will be negligible because g zero is very small. Uh, and then the idea is that uh, well, I will have some term that contain only one field, but this basically will drop out uh, from my. Uh, uh, if I write the corresponding Langevin equation, because they describe um, uh, basically 
I, I calculated my alpha in such a way that they would drop out. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be also an attractor. And then I have these quadratic terms here, uh, where, um, uh, OK, I guess this B should be a delta B as well if I have also displaced the field. But OK, this is the, the idea. And so you see uh, there are two. Uh, yeah, it becomes a completely linear equation. Uh, but now the, the coupling constant is not anymore. This is zero, but uh, uh, it's multiplied by the, the amplitude of the field, which is the square root of the number of circulating protons, as you remember. Uh, and so uh, this is very nice because it means that the fact that I was starting with this uh, nonlinear Hamiltonian uh, uh, means that basically I have a, offers me a knob to tune the interaction. So. I arrive to linear Hamiltonian, which is tunable. I can tune it in two ways. Uh, so by uh, tuning the amplitude, uh, so having more and more uh, photons. Uh, and then uh, another thing that it's uh, in principle possible, I, I can also tune the phase of this, uh, of this alpha by changing uh, the, the by changing the, the driving. OK, this actually, it's, if I have just a single optomechanical system with one optical and one mechanical mode, will not, not be very important, but it will be important in the case where I start to combine many optical and mechanical modes. OK, maybe I, uh, uh, I explained it better here. Uh, so you see, this would be the corresponding Langevin equation once I've linearized uh, my interaction. Uh, and uh, so as you see, I have this uh, G, which is now a complex number. But if I have only these two modes and they are not coupled to any other mode, uh, actually what I can do, I can basically absorb the G, this G in the, in the definition of A. I can make a gauge transformation. And so I, uh, oh, by the way, uh, sorry, yeah, I, and from now on, uh, I, instead of writing delta A, I write A just for the sake of uh, having a simple notation. Yeah, actually it should be delta if, if I want to be consistent with what I was shown before. Uh, okay, but so the, the point that I was commenting, so in principle you have this complex G and this will be important if say, for instance, this cavity is coupled to a different cavity uh, that maybe is driven, uh, yeah, or, or just said this, so it's coupled to a different cavity. This will be important. Uh, uh, I think if I, had, I need to have to drive for this to be important also. Yeah, I think this is the main key, actually. OK, but in this case, if I have just one optical mode and one mechanical mode and one drive, I have just one phase and I can gauge it away. And so I can arrive to this simple form. Um, and you see this is just the Langevin equation for two linearly coupled oscillators. So this will be the position of the optical oscillator. And that this would be the position of the mechanical oscillator. Uh, so what is uh, uh, slightly unusual here is that we are describing the situation out of equilibrium. So if I, uh, this B in, again, I thank you, Carl, for pointing this out. This B in shouldn't be under the square root. And this A in was not. Uh, um, but uh, if I write the, the correlators of B in with B in, I will see that this buff has some thermal noise. And so the physical situation is like this. I have a mechanical mode uh, that can uh, decay in, into the buff, but can also absorb thermal excitation from the buff. And I have a, a, an optical mode that is coupled to uh, to a cold buff uh, and uh, uh, that it can only, uh, but the only effect is that the, 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 the excitation decay into the cold buff. Uh, and so all of these is linear, so it would be uh, technically uh, very easy to solve and calculate any correlator. Um, but uh, so the problem is that this, uh, these things describe, this, this uh, Langevin equation describe um, like a very rich physics that change very much if I change uh, my, um, uh, 
uh, if I change my parameters, so if I, there are many different situations I could consider, I could consider strong coupling that G becomes larger than Kappa. I could consider uh, that Kappa is fast uh, and so the cavity reacts immediately. Uh, or I could, uh, so this happens if kappa is much larger than the mechanical decay, or I could consider a situation where, sorry, the mechanical frequency, eigenfrequency omega, uh, or I could consider a situation where I'm side bend result. Is my, so there are a lot of different situations, and if I would try to just go shut up and calculate, I would get just some very cumbersome um, expression, and then it would be less easy to read out. Uh, the physics. So that's why uh, uh, to, to explain the physics, normally we do uh, uh, like further approximation. Uh, yeah. Maybe on the previous slide, the absorption from the hot bath, um, should there be a plus? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's also another title. It should be uh, gamma and, and thermal. So the difference is always the, the, the difference between uh, uh, absorption and, and emission is this plus one. Yeah, so this is also a typo. Yeah, thank you for pointing this out. Uh, yeah, I prepared the slide a little bit <laughs> last minute. Okay. Um, yeah, so right. Thank you for pointing this out. Um, and um, yeah, and this gamma is always the decay rate, and yeah, kappa is the decay rate. Okay. Um, okay, so. Now I want to, uh, and say this, I want to understand a little bit better this optomechanical linear Hamiltonian and, um, uh, and give a physical interpretation for all the terms. So I can slightly write it in, in this way. So I uh, basically isolate the term where I just transfer uh, one excitation from one mode to the other. Of course, both directions are possible. The other term is then in this plus emission conjugate. Uh, and then uh, uh, there are terms. And so this term conserves the excitation number. And then there are this term that where you, I create either two, uh, like either a phonon, I create a, a photon and a phonon or destroy them. So this the, the, the particle conservative term are normally referred refer as spin splitting term and this as two mode squeezing term. And so let's see what they do and which physical process they describe. Basically, this term is here, is A dagger B, because the following thing can happen. So I could uh, absorb a laser photon um, and uh, um, and a phonon at the same time, and this creates a, a, a photon in the cavity. For conservation of energy, this uh, photon in the cavity will have energy of the omega laser plus omega. And so you see that this term uh, is resonant if I have that uh, minus delta is equal to omega. If I'm in this physical situation here, I just plot uh, the, the density of state of the, of the cavity. And um, the idea is that if I play, if I have a red detune laser and the distance uh, of the laser, it's red detune and the distance from the cavity resonance is exactly omega, then this process is exactly, uh, it's exactly uh, resonance. So omega L plus omega give the, the resonance frequency. Okay. And, uh, and this process, you see, it's uh, since the, the optical buff is uh, it's a very uh, it's fast and it has it's as a cold temperature. This process can lead to cooling. So because they have that this photon are transferred to the cavity and then immediately when they are in the cavity they decay, and then I uh, all the time I absorb photon and, and this. Uh, can allow cooling. And also it's the process that allow me to transfer, for instance, an optical state to a mechanical state, because I can uh, basically uh, this allow me to, to, to change it. And so that's cooling and translucent. Um, okay. Um, ah, okay. And then another important thing. So I mentioned that this, uh, the relative scale of omega and kappa is important. And if I'm, I'm in the regime where uh, omega is really fast, 
uh, it means uh, uh, that um, um, it means that basically I can neglect the other term in the memory tunnel. Okay, I will explain it uh, later on uh, in more detail. Okay, and um, yeah, then I come to the other term. So this is the two mod squeezing term. Yeah, I create two. The final outcome is to create a phonon, uh, a photon and a phonon. And uh, this, um, these two um, excitation, they actually originally come from a laser photon. And um, to conserve the energy, I have that the cavity photon uh, as the energy of uh, omega laser uh, minus omega. So you, and so from this you see that it's resonance if the laser uh, is exactly uh, it's build a tune and the distance from the cavity resonance is the resonance is exactly omega. And you see when I was in the red tune regime and side result this would be widely out of resonance. That's why I could neglect it. And okay, here yeah, again the same story. If I'm uh, uh, if I am uh, in the, in the sideband resolve regime, I can uh, neglect uh, the I can neglect the, the beam splitting term and focus only on this term, at least to first approximation. Okay, and then just a reminder because we consider this, so there is another uh, situation that it's very interesting for in octo mechanics and occurs many times, and this is when I uh, instead of picking one uh, uh, sideband or the other, uh, I just drive perfect resonance with the cavity. And in this case, basically the two terms are uh, like contributing equally. And so I have to keep both of them. Uh, and so in this case, I have this basically bilinear cup in between two oscillators, both terms are resonance. And this is the, the situation where I have uh, sensing. And typically, this when when I'm uh, uh, when I'm when I'm in this situation, I typically it, it's convenient to be also in, in the in a situation where where the cavity is not sideband resolved. Okay, uh, now I wanted to switch uh, to the mode with the tablet and some calculation. Okay, uh, so now I um, want to explain exactly how you eliminate this um, fast oscillating term and do some calculation. Uh, so, for instance, to show exactly how I achieve cooling uh, and other things. Okay, so the the first thing I'm going to explain is the it's really a wall curve. Password F. I want to change the color of my pen. Otherwise, you're not going to see anything. Hey, Vittorio, can I just ask a question about what you yes. went through? Yes. Um, 
so you, you mentioned that there was like three different like modes from the Hamiltonian. The the beam fitting one is used for cooling. Uh, okay, not different modes, uh, different, different terms um, in the interaction. Yeah, sorry, different uh, modes is the wrong word. The three different aspects of the Hamiltonian. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, exactly. They are just, I start with just one term in the Hamiltonian and then I rewrite it. Uh, and um, and then basically when I, I rewrite it, um, I, I have like basically two different terms. So all, there are always always the complex conjugate terms, but there are two types of terms. So terms that that um, that conserve the particle number and terms that do not conserve. So there are terms where I convert a photon into a phonon, uh, and um, um, and uh, I, I convert. Uh, um, and, and when I convert, uh, it turns when I convert IPA to excitation. And I yeah. can understand this term as Raman scattering uh, process, different Raman scattering processes. Basically, this is the message. But okay, sorry, what was the question? The question is just uh, that you mentioned that this um, mode is used for, or this aspect is used for cooling, but the, 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 the one at the end is used for sensing. What is, what's the one, what's the two mode squeezing? Is it used for anything? Is like a blue shifting. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't explain. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a little bit too fast. Yeah, exactly. So tangling, tangling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I didn't. So the question is, what? Why do I use the? Uh, how is this term useful? Right? Or is this the question? Yeah, that was the question. Sorry, okay, yeah. great. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, sorry. I intended to say it, and then I was a little bit too quick. Uh, yeah. So the idea is that uh, you. In this case, you um, yeah you create two excitation together, and so this excitation will be entangled, and so you can use this term to uh, basically create uh, entanglement between the mechanical uh, uh, between the mechanical and the optical part of your system, uh, and uh, you can also um, uh, then, for instance, you could do. I hope I will have time to talk about this. So there are experiments where, for instance, you entangle the um, uh, basically the the, fluctu the mechanical fluctuation with the optical fluctuations, and then uh, at a later time you transfer back the mechanical fluctuation into the cavity, and then and then you create uh, a entanglement in in the outgoing cavity fields, like temporary entanglement. So you can do all kinds of tricks, and this is the basic resources that give you entanglement. And then the other thing where it's important, uh, basically what happens in this case is that now the process that uh, that its resonance tend to add photons uh, on the cavity, and uh, this can create an instability at some point. And uh, um, and uh, this is related to a question that we had uh, before. So I, I, I can have an off bifurcation and I start to have that my mechanics start to self oscillating. So this is what lasing uh, is about. Uh, of course, when I start to have this self sustained oscillation, uh, I need to take into account the, the nonlinear term again. Uh, okay, so, so that's what lasing means. Lasing is when you get a self-sustaining oscillation. Yeah, exactly. That's what lasing means. Yeah, and it's related to this op bifurcation we, we somebody mentioned earlier. Okay, then maybe I switch again. Uh, um, maybe just quickly before yeah. you do, um, yeah. mentioning in the sensing application, you're looking for the opposite condition where you have uh, your uh, optical loss rate being much larger than the mechanical frequency. Is this just so you can make sure you can read out any? mechanical sensing quickly as it happens? Or is there some other fundamental reason that you're concentrating on this regime? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yes, the idea is that, uh, mm, that so if I have this condition, then both of these terms are, are resonance. And so I'm really working inside of, of the cavity uh, bandwidth. Uh, otherwise, I, uh, yeah, basically, I, I'm trying to, to uh, to measure some more that some some very 
patients that are outside uh, of, of the cavity of the airway. So that's the idea. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? There's another question in the chat, uh, namely, what is the difference between uh, two mode squeezing and single mode squeezing? Ah, yeah, okay. So single mode squeezing, you uh, basically you can have it uh, uh, even if you have just a single mode, and then you will have a term with uh, a dagger, a dagger, and um, so basically the two mode squeezing typically creates entanglement between two, uh, so influence the cross correlation between two modes, whereas uh, single mode squeezing uh, can entangle, uh, can squeeze the quadrature of of a single mode. Uh, so it, in, in this case, the single mode squeezing would be a term with a dagger, a dagger, or b dagger, b dagger. So it describes that I'm creating two photons, and this typically uh, occurs when I have a K2 nonlinearity and, and some parametric side. Okay, uh, any other question? Um, I have another question. Uh, yes. So the three different situations. Uh, they can be there. They can they cannot happen simultaneously, right? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, if I exactly so. Um, so if I the idea is that if I'm not say bundle solved, then all the so by uh, uh, my important you can have the three different situation or I don't know. Can you say it? Sorry. Again? Can you say it, it, it again? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, maybe I, I have a good question to your answer. So if you have more than one drive, uh, then you could, uh, and this is really something that has been done in optomechanics, uh, you can have that one drive, uh, like basically, so that both, so that, um, so I have at the same time uh, some bin splitting term and some two mode squeezing term because I, and they are both rational just because I have two different drives. So this can happen. But if I have just one drive and I'm sub band resolved, uh, so but then I'm in a situation when one of the term is much more important than the other. So this doesn't mean that the other term is completely irre irrelevant. So for instance, um, uh, when we study cooling, uh, it's very important. So the fact that I have the other term sets a limit on how, uh, how uh, close to the ground state I, I can come. Um, so basically um, the, the number of photon that I can achieve. So at some point, the idea is that I can, if I want to, to cool, okay, this, I will explain it later. I will um, somehow I have a competition between this thermal uh, uh, path, for this, for the mechanical oscillator, and then I have this cooling from the optical mode. And basically, I can say win this competition by just uh, increasing the uh, the coupling. And so then the um, this cooling we will really see coming out of a, of a calculation. The, the cooling, uh, so I can cool faster and faster. And so this decreases the photon uh, number. So I can win this. Uh, uh, this competition with the hot mechanical bath, but I still have the problem that although this counter rotating term, this two mode squeezing term, they are weak, at some point when I arrive at a very small temperature, they start to play a role and they set the limit on, on, the, on the cooling that I can have. So to get very precise result, I should really use the full Hamiltonian, but to understand the physics, uh, uh, it's always good to try to like consider one just one of the terms. Uh, does this okay. answer your question? Uh, yeah, and the and the sensing region is that uh, happening uh, for a different uh, for different in tuning the tuning scale or for a different value always... the tuning, different value of the detuning. Yeah, so I, I okay. this. Um, yeah, so basically in one case, uh, you see the condition is that omega uh, is uh, equal to delta. And, uh, um, and so you see this delta as this definition, yet I have a different sign. So this is like, uh, would be like if you 
think that this is for a mechanical oscillator, this omega can only be positive, right? Whereas for a cavity, I can, since the Hamiltonian is in the rotating frame, I can really have that this delta is positive, which means it's like an oscillator with negative frequency. Uh, so this the, um, when I'm in, in the Bluetooth side. And this is what creates, allows for like paves the way to an instability when I couple this uh, positive frequency and negative frequency oscillator in the rotating frame, of course. Um, okay, uh, any other question? Okay, then maybe I switch to the uh, part of the board. Um, okay. Basically, um, so yeah, the idea is that uh, I want to explain uh, this technique that it's really important in quantum optic. Um, of rotating wave approximation. That is the one that I use to uh, uh, and the goal is also to do some calculation and show how I get cooling and things like this. Okay, so the idea is that um, um, now to introduce the rotating wave approximation, I will use again the Hamiltonian description. So uh, I start from my inherent Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. Okay, this is my linear Hamiltonian. As we discussed, we just have two oscillators that are uh, coupled linearly. Um, and, um, and then the idea is that they want to consider the uh, regime where omega is much larger than the decay rate. This is important because afterwards I will go back to my Langevin equation and uh, we will see why this is important. And then I want to consider uh, that I'm uh, the situation where the beam splitting terms are less nice, are less nice. So this minus delta is uh, similar as omega. Okay. And in this case, it is convenient to switch to the following rotating frame. So the idea is that uh, in this Hamiltonian, I also assume that G, uh, uh, not only kappa, also G should be much smaller than, uh, than omega. So this, uh, uh, so this is something that uh, every time that I have a rotating wave approximation, I am in a physical situation where there is a frequency that is like the largest frequency and all of the frequency are kind of slow. And then in this case, it's convenient to uh, go in a rotating frame where all the frequency are slow. And this I achieve with the following uh, transformation. Okay, so you see, I uh, for uh, uh, for the cavity, I you remember I when I, I write this Hamiltonian in the first place, uh, I'm in a frame that rotates as the laser frequency, and now I switch again. Ah, so yeah, I forgot the time, and here I go again to a rotating frame, and uh, I subtract to this frequency. Uh, basically delta. So uh, now I'm, for the cavity, I'm in a frame that rotate as uh, omega cavity, right? You remember delta was defined as omega laser minus omega cavity. 
And so if I write omega n minus delta, which is what I'm doing here, I uh, in a frame that rotates at the cavity as mine. So this is what I'm doing. And for the mechanical oscillator, I also switch to the to the same uh, frame. Um, and so which means that you remember that uh, this formula, I have uh, a unitary transformation. Uh, this change is my Hamiltonian. Uh, and the new Hamiltonian, the rotating frame, uh, it, this is uh, changing the following way. So there is uh, the standard uh, formula that would hold for a, for a static unitary transformation. Um, but uh, uh, here I have also some um, um, additional term. Uh, So it is. Um, yeah, some additional time derivative of the. And, and then basically, this term um, uh, basically changes yeah, the, the, the sum frequency. So I have something like this. So because of this term, I will have that uh, uh, I have another term with plus delta i delta a that cancel out this one. So I don't have uh, any, so I went in, in, in basically I subtracted this, this, this coherent evolution. And then I just, for the cavity, I just, uh, okay. And so I don't have this term anymore. And for this, I just have uh, omega and I also subtract the same plus delta. Uh, and you see, this is now a slow frequency because omega is uh, similar as uh, minus delta. So this is now a very small frequency. Um, and then, okay, uh, another thing that I have to say um, in order to see how this term uh, transform, I have to see how, uh, what is UA and the dagger? And this is e to the, uh, you can prove that is e to the i delta t. Okay. So if you want to convince uh, yourself of this formula, uh, just apply uh, this to a Fox state. Uh, and uh, you will see that uh, for any possible Fox state, you, you very easily get this result. And so since the Fox state, uh, uh, span the whole uh, space, it means that, uh, yeah, it's just, I just have this very simple scalar uh, change. Okay, and then if I keep this in mind, and I will have, of course, a similar uh, expression for uh, for D, because you see very key, I have that this term uh, with the A dagger A uh, uh, on the acton A, because the, the B commutates, and then I have the same thing for the B. And so I get exactly the same formula. Um, and uh, then the Newtonian becomes minus G. Um, and then, uh, so if I do the same thing with the dagger, I um, uh, just as, um, basically, I, I, I just have the complex conjugate. And so I would have the same again. Yeah, so that's it. So they rotate at the opposite frequency, which means that if I have term uh, uh, where uh, I have both an A and a B, they are uh, time independent. So this is really by by construction. So I really choose when I when I define this transformation. That's the reason why I. Um, 
why I choose the same that both uh, oscillate or rotate at the same frequency in the, in the rotating frame. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and so these become constants. Whereas, if I for the term where I have a dagger and b dagger, uh, you see, I oh, Okay. So, um, so now I can say something that I wanted to write. Um, so I have this term with the idea B. Uh, so this becomes constant in the rotating frame, uh, but then this term with a dagger the dagger, uh, they rotate as frequency. So it's a little bit of a mess. Let's move this a little bit. Um, okay, so so you see this this both a dagger and the dagger they pick up this face and and then that's why they rotate fast and then I have as usual the animation candidate and the Newtonian will be animation. Okay, so um, yeah, so this would be my Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. Um, and now I, uh, uh, as I've done for the single optical mode, I can just write Langevin equation for this uh, Hamiltonian. So now the Langevin equation will have this term. Uh, and then I, um, uh, from the interaction, I get the following term. Okay, well, and likewise for B. Here I have this. Um, And then interaction. So the optical and the mechanical mode enters in a symmetric way in the Hamiltonian, so I will have exactly the same term as with A instead of B. And maybe I get to drop these two. A little bit of space. Okay. And then now you see, uh, so the idea is that um, here are all the frequency that enters in, in this differential equation, they are all small. So it's important that also this k is small 
and uh, uh, that's why I, I need the, this condition. Yeah. So they are they are all small, which means that if I do not consider these terms here, uh, and I calculate how R varies, it's going to be how A and B varies in the rotating frame, they are going to have a very slow dynamic, which means that uh, this term, uh, basically I can approximate this as a constant on the time where this term varies, and so basically just average out. So that's the rotating wave approximation. If I uh, have some fast, uh, like a, a frequency in the problem, in this case, omega and delta, which is much larger than the other frequency, is convenient to go in a frame where I uh, basically this frequency does not enter anymore. And then I get some uh, uh, slow dynamics with some fast oscillating term, and I can neglect this fast oscillating term. Okay, so uh, exactly. So then now the situation is, is uh, very simple, and uh, uh, in particular, I can very easily uh, solve for A and obtain very simple formula. Yeah. So yesterday. Um, okay, and then this multiplies. Okay, so you see that this is the solution of this. Okay, yeah, of course there was a dot. So this is the solution of this differential equation because uh, there is this express explicit dependence of t in the in inside of the integral. Uh, and when I derive, I get this term. And uh, then this, there is this other term. And then when I, uh, instead, when I, the, the other term, I get it when I, uh, these other terms, I get it when I take the, the value of the integral, at, uh, when I take that t prime is equal to t. Um, okay. Just a couple of quick housekeeping yeah. questions. Yeah. That's um, all right. Yeah. We should be able to yeah. yeah. Um, in the uh, B uh, dot Langevin equation, uh, the term that's been crossed out, it should be uh, an e to the minus i to delta t. Yeah. Time um, be dagger. Time be dagger. Um, and the integration is with respect to dt prime. Correct? Yeah, and the integration with respect to dt prime. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is my this is my uh, the solution for A, and then the idea is that uh, okay, now I can do another approximation. Um, basically, I do the following approximation. That um, so you see this uh, now. I'm considering another. Uh, so it's important to assume an, an, another condition that uh, G is much smaller than Kappa. So basically, I, I want to, uh, so my goal is would be also like to investigate cooling. 
And uh, so I want to be in the regime where basically the optical cavity behaves as a buff for the mechanical muscle. It has to decay quickly on the times on the time scale of, of the motion of the mechanical motion in the rotating frame. And so basically the condition for this is that this uh, G is much more than kappa. And if I do this, basically I can uh, in this integral, I can um, uh, basically I can uh, uh, substitute uh, the um, I can replace uh, B of uh, T prime um, uh, with B of T, basically. Because, um, yeah, so the idea is that uh, to this integral contributes all, all the times uh, that. Uh, uh, only, so all the times that are very close to T, so this decay quickly. Uh, okay, but here I'm slightly confused because I really think that well, here there should be a plus. Uh, I know. Uh, sorry for large negative time is positive. Okay, no. So then this should be a minus. That's correct. Right. Yeah. For large negative time, uh, this uh, is positive and it should be the case, so it's a minus as you also see it from here. Okay, good. Uh, and um, okay, and then so for this reason, since this uh, uh, like kernel decay very, very fast compared to the uh, time over which B changes, I can just replace B this B of T prime with B of T. Um, and I can also um, replace a in of the time with a of t. And then if I do this, uh, maybe I have to get rid of something here to get my, oh, maybe I can just do it this. It's a in between the page, so that you can see the question. Okay, yeah, this looks good. Um, okay, and then I mm, basically, um, okay, if I do this approximation, I get that A is approximately equal to. Uh, basically, I can take these guys out of the integral. Okay, and um, and then I still have the integral. Which uh, is equal to two divided by K. This will be the result of, of the integral once I've taken this guy out. Okay, um, uh, and then the next thing I do, I uh, substitute uh, these into the, the equation for the mechanics. And uh, so basically like this, I have eliminated my optical but and I, uh, my, my, my optical mode that acts as, as a thermal buff for the mechanics and I get the Langevin equation for the mechanics. And basically, uh, I have the following situation.
Um, so I had this term that I had also before. And, um, but the, then when I'm plugging um, uh, this uh, term here, uh, so you see I replace this A with this, you see I get another term that's proportional to B. Uh, and in particular, it's, uh, um, I was following it. Um, big minus square divided by kappa times b. Is this good? Ah, sorry. Uh, actually, it's there is also a factor of two here because yeah, this factor of two, so two g squared divided by kappa times b. So uh, again, so I'm I'm finding this when I plug this guy here and I place it here. I have two terms. One is this one, and you see I have i per i gives me a minus. Then g squared. Then I have this two, and I have this k. So two g squared divided by k b. Um, okay, the other time I will uh, write it later on. Uh, as usual. And then I have this term here. Where, so I apply this in and I want to rewrite this. Um, and then, so here in principle, I have an I. Okay, let's, let's write it for now, um, and then, okay, yeah, uh, and then I have, uh, so here I have square root of k divided by k, so in total I have uh, two uh, g uh, divided by square root of k, and then square root of a, No, sorry. Why is the root? <laughs> okay. Uh, just a. Okay. okay. So now I'm almost there. I just want to uh, do some uh, form, some definition. Uh, so I define gamma optical to be or g squared divided by kappa. And uh, I define, maybe I, sorry, I switch again notation. Let's say that now the, 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 the decay uh, that comes from the mechanical bath, I call it gamma intrinsic to distinguish with this gamma optical. So yeah, it will also be gamma intrinsic. Uh, and then now I define a new gamma that is like the total gamma. Uh, it is going to be gamma intrinsic plus gamma optical. Uh, because you see here, basically this is gamma optical half. And so I can view, this is basically gamma optical is the damping that comes from the optical half. Uh, and so I can uh, basically write this equation like this. So yeah, maybe it was a bad idea to get rid of this, but it's difficult to go back. <laughs> okay, so I just sum up the two terms and I get gamma. And then you see that also that this term actually is, 
the square root of gamma optical. If I bring this inside of the square root, uh, the 2G inside of the square root, I can also replace this object by the square root of gamma optical. Anyway, what time is it? Uh, do I have enough time? 20 minutes, okay, I will try to speed it up a little bit. Um, okay, so the idea is that uh, I have this I, uh, this I is not very important. I can make a gauge transformation and get rid of it uh, for the optical bar. Uh, so then let's just get rid of it. Uh, and then I have this, uh, this equation, which is is exactly the same as we had yesterday when we were discussing um, like a cavity with two pores or a cavity with intrinsic dissipation. Now the situation is like this. This cavity is actually my mechanical oscillator. So this should be a mechanical oscillator, but uh, in the input output formalism, I can do it as a cavity. And I have this in field uh, coming in, and then there will be an out field coming uh, out. I do not have experimentally access to this out field, but I can define it. And then uh, basically the idea is that uh, I can do the cavity as also like another bath that as a port that goes to the mechanical oscillator. Uh, and I and so it's very similar as a cavity with two port. Here it's slightly unusual. I have something different. Normally, when I have a cavity with two port, I would have that uh, the two port talks to bath that are the same temperature. Whereas here I have like a hot bath and a, and a cold bath. And this difference uh, appears in the uh, commutation ratio of, of this field. I have that uh, B in dagger T B is equal and by term I And my term and that of t minus the prime. Uh, whereas for the, uh, for the optical field, I have that this is zero, right? And then this describe. Uh, absorption from the bath, uh, whereas if I want to describe spontaneous emission, I will have that uh, D of T, B of T prime. of the monster pen. Okay. Okay, so yeah, that's the difference if I of this mechanical system coupled to to this optical bath that was my original optical mode. Uh, it's just only here in the noise. But uh, okay now I want to very briefly okay maybe let's go since there is not much time let's go directly to the cooling. One thing that I wanted to mention before is that last time we learned that we have this impedance matching condition uh, that um, when the um, when I have two port and they have the same uh, the same coupling, I have this very special situation that everything that comes in from one port comes out in the other port. Uh, and this is what is uh, referred in optomechanics as uh, 
uh, in this setting where I have an optical uh, mode and a cavity mode, you refer as omit, auto mechanically induced transparency. And you see this means, so if I look at, I look at the perspective of the optical field, I, uh, I'm shining light on a mirror and normally this would be reflected. And suddenly, uh, when I'm driving exactly at resonance, uh, uh, and in the bandwidth that is set by this, um, uh, by this mechanical uh, decay rate, I have that uh, everything is absorbed. So it's like as if the mirror has become transparent. Uh, there is, yeah, everything goes through and transferred to the mechanics. Okay, I wanted to mention this, this is something very uh, important in optical mechanics. Uh, and now I want to go to the cooling. So uh, for the cooling, I now let's consider again the simplest possible situation where I'm driving exactly at the sideband. Uh, so at the rest sideband, uh, omega plus delta is equal to zero. And uh, then I can, I could find the solution also in general, but uh, uh, I want to write something simple. So I want to consider this solution and I can write B solving this equation. And then B is the following, uh, the integral from, from minus infinity to uh, T. So now I'm considering that this is zero, and so I just get e to the minus uh, gamma t minus t prime, and then these terms here. Okay, and um, now with the solution, I can easily calculate uh, the number of phonons in the cavity. So I just plug the solution uh, inside of this formula. Um, okay, maybe I. It's first I do it. Um, so I have two integrals, one for the uh, B dagger term and the other for the B terms. Uh, and then uh, maybe here we can also take instead of t zero because anyway B dagger B is the stationary occupation is so it's going to be independent of time, uh, and then I um, uh, write it to the uh, gamma uh, t prime plus t second, and then uh, I. Square root of gamma uh, in Dhaka plus uh, square root of gamma optical uh, as also Dhaka. So this is the comes from this B dagger, and then I have the signal term for B right here. Then I have B to root of gamma optical Okay, uh, and then the mean value. So this this thing is all inside. Okay, and then um, the idea is that now the B uh, and the A do not uh, basically they 
they are not correlated. So the and so they can not have any cross term. Uh, and so what I get is integral from minus infinity to t one t power. So I have the term where I multiply this b dagger with the b and I calculate the uh, the uh, mean value and this gives me um, uh, gamma n and then uh, and term on. Delta of uh, T five minus T two, and basically that's it actually because uh, the, the 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 mean so the 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 correlator of a dagger and A is zero because I'm at zero temperature and there are no cross correlations so the A and the B uh, bars are not uh, correlated. Okay, and then I should not forget this into the gram. Uh, okay. T plus the gram. Uh, yeah, I had forgotten that one half, so it's a bit into the one half. Okay, uh, now, so I have this delta, so I get rid of the one integral, so I just get uh, into the gram from minus infinity to zero. Uh, uh, gamma mechanical times and term. Okay, so I also calculate the integral. Uh, so the, this integral is just one over gamma, right? And so and then get rid of this. And I have to do this final event. Okay, and to work to uh, uh, simplify this, uh, uh, to rewrite it in a nicer way. Uh, so basically, I'm uh, interested, especially interested in the, the regime where uh, uh, now I want to cool, so I want that this gamma optical, the optical uh, bath uh, become much faster than the mechanical bath. So I want to, this gamma optical to be much larger than gamma uh, intrinsic. And you remember gamma optical, we have calculated uh, it's given by the, this formula equals four g squared divided by kappa. Okay, so we want, uh, and so maybe let, let's write it then explicit. So since gamma is gamma mechanical plus gamma optical, I can also like uh, write simplify. I say that this is almost if gamma optical is much larger than gamma mechanical is something like this, right? And um, I can uh, write it in an even more nice way. Uh, so like this, where this is the cooperativity. Uh, so I, I want to, so this is a quantity that's very important not to mechanics. Uh, and um, if you plug in gamma, gamma optical, you can read off that this is just um, four g squared uh, divided by kappa gamma, which, by the way, you see it's also um, okay. Um, so you see that the idea is that the 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 number of photon is decreased by this cooperativity. And in particular, I can have 
ground state cooling if I have that uh, uh, G, the cooperativity, divided by N bar uh, is much larger than one. And um, uh, so this condition is uh, this, okay, this C divided by N, N, uh, N and that I write again is for the square divided by alpha, gamma, and theta is uh, often referred as quantum cooperativity. So, and this is really always the quantity that you need it to be large if you want to see quantum methods. Um, because, yeah, it has a very, um, very physical meaning. <laughs> uh, so again, what I want to add is that all G squared divided by kappa, uh, uh, kappa. So this is the time scale over which the optics act on the mechanics. Uh, basically is uh, much larger. This is still equivalent to this. Uh, it's much larger than gamma and term. And this is the typical time scale that I need for a phonon to enter the system. So if I can decay faster than the typical time uh, at which, uh, at, after which a photon enters, I can basically cool very close to the ground state. So this is the meaning of this uh, thing. And uh, maybe, uh, so before we also quickly discuss this omit and note that uh, omit, so I had this impedance matching that all the light shining uh, uh, on, on the system is, uh, I have a one pore cavity coupled to mechanics and I shine light and everything gets absorbed. The condition for this was also one. And this, this by the way, is also the condition to uh, have the maximum, what we discussed last time, to have the maximum possible uh, precision. So you remember we discussed this standard quantum limits where we have the imprecision, uh, uh, like we have two types of norm, the, the imprecision, so due to the, uh, that it's just uh, the short noise of the measurement. Uh, but then I have also the back action, this noise that I'm adding because the, the quantum fluctuation I on the mechanics and add noise is the detection noise. And they are exactly, they take exactly the same value and reach the standard quantum limit of the precision also for when this cooperativity is equal one. So this cooperative is always the quantity that, uh, that enters uh, in basically all uh, optomechanical system. And if I'm talking about it, all optomechanical phenomena, and if, I, if I'm talking about um, quantum phenomena always enters the cooperativity divided by the, the number of thermal photon in the mechanical bar. Okay, I guess this was enough for today. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any at the moment, neither on YouTube nor in Zoom. But then again, we've had a really, we've had really quite a lot of ex great explanations and uh, maybe this is a good time to take it up or a good uh, time to take or a good position in the lecture to take it up tomorrow again. So um, if you have a quick question, there's maybe still one or two minutes. If not, then I would say we thank Vittorio for this really nice lecture today and we'll see all of you tomorrow. Ah, wait, there is some, there's one question in the chat. Okay, great, great. Is there a standard reference for this calculation? Is there? A standard reference for this calculation. So ah, some um, well, so to be honest, I, it should be everywhere. Um, so I don't know, I just did it on my blog very quickly before the, uh, the lecture. Uh, I'm not sure uh, where it is done exactly this way because there are many ways how you can derive this, this kind of results. So maybe I can uh, I can look it up for next time where exactly to look at this line of, of calculation. But the technique that I use are really like all the standard uh, thing that you always do. So you do a rotating with. So I combine, let's say, many techniques that often uh, uh, appears in quantum optics, so you uh, 
So the single pieces, you will see it everywhere in, a, in a quantum optics books, let's say. So the rotating wave approximation, so, uh, and, um, uh, so because the, the, in principle you can, uh, and actually you should do also the calculation, including also the, the counter rotating term. I mentioned it before during the lecture. And then you can see that actually it's not as the story is not as simple. So you see, my, as I told the story here, um, I if I increase the the the, uh, the the interaction strength, but still remaining in the in the weak coupling regime, I I can cool more and more. And uh, but actually, if I also include the counter rotating term, there is also some correction that limits the, the cooling and that uh, depends on the ratio of kappa and uh, omega, basically. Uh, okay, but sorry, now I'm <laughs> deviating from your question. Yeah, I don't know, I, maybe I will look up where uh, uh, somebody, where, where there is exactly like this level of approximation that they've done here. And in the same form, I'm so I'm not sure where it is. Or otherwise, I can write it neatly and send it to you. So because yeah, this has become a little bit of a mess. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. A lot of there is a, there are a lot of thank yous in the chat. So I suppose okay. that uh, sounds great. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Vittorio, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much, Kara. Thank you.